See the blue sky, feel the wind that blows. Get the rushing, heaven over knows. I'm all alone, still I far from lonely. On a journey, on a winding road. We're tired of the running, we're catching up. I got hungry for the sunny, high mountain top. And it's showtime, or in this case, snow time. Um, without further delay, I want to welcome to the screen my two guests for today, Lynn Shepard and Honey Ward. Hello, sisters. Hey. Hi. Great to be with you. So um, for the benefit of the three of us to refresh our memories and to also give our viewers some more insight to set the context uh, for our conversation, I actually want to read the official information from Wikipedia about National Coming Out Day. It's a bit odd to read something about a historic event, but in this case, we were there. So from Wikipedia. We're that old. Na yeah, exactly. And you know what? I'm so grateful that we're still here. Uh, from Wikipedia, National Coming Out Day is an annual LGBT Awareness Day observed on October 11th to support lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and sometimes other groups typically grouped within the LGBT community to come out of the closet. First celebrated in the United States in 1988, the initial idea was grounded in the feminist and gay liberation spirit of the personal being political and the emphasis on the most basic form of activism being coming out to family, friends, and colleagues and living life as an openly lesbian or gay person. The foundational belief is that homophobia thrives in an atmosphere of silence and ignorance and that once people know they have loved ones who are lesbian or gay, they are far less likely to maintain homophobic or oppressive views. NCOD was inaugurated in 1988 by Rob Eichberg and Jean O'Leary. Eichberg, who died in 1995 of complications from AIDS, was a psychologist from New Mexico and the founder of the personal growth workshop, The Experience. O'Leary was an openly lesbian political leader and longtime activist from New York and was at the time head of the National Gay Rights Advocates in Los Angeles. LGBT activists, including Eichberg and O'Leary, did not want to respond defensively to anti-LGBT action because they believed it would be predictable. This led them to establish National Coming Out Day in order to maintain positivity and celebrate coming out. The date of October 11th was chosen because it is the anniversary of the 1987 March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights. So, um, first of all, do either one of you have any, any, any disagreements? There's more information we're going to add, but do any of you have any disagreements as this is reflected in Wikipedia? I, I well, don't I would, know who I wrote it. Just, I, I think it's fairly, it's fairly accurate. 
And I would add that October 11th was also Eleanor Roosevelt's birthday, which made it a great day to choose as well. Fantastic, fantastic. So one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted us to backtrack a little bit in our own lives before 1988. Um, I'll begin to help give you two the sense of sort of where I want you to go with your own answers. So uh, I came out at the age of about 21 in 1983 while attending Arizona State University uh, in uh, Tempe, Arizona. I was recovering from my own Republican upbringing and I was in college getting to know my own, my own being, you know, getting out from my own family structure. But at that time, we were looking head on at the, uh, what would become known as the AIDS epidemic. And what I learned, the biggest catalyst and the biggest change maker in my life was seeing people I knew and didn't know who were dying. And the message that I got fundamentally was that the most powerful thing that I had, more powerful than anything, was the ability to express my own life force and to express my own truth. So that led me on a journey that took me to Los Angeles uh, a couple of times, but I landed there for a long period of time in 1987. At which point, uh, not new to what would, were described at the time as transformational seminars, I heard about the Experience Weekend, which we'll get into more. But my Experience Weekend happened in April of 1988. I want to say it was April 23rd and 24th because my birthday was the 25th and I remember that this ha had to do with my own um, birthday. So um, that is a nutshell of what my coming out process briefly that brought me up to the moment when I met you which was five months before the first ever nation, uh, national coming out day. So which one of you would like to pick up where, uh, 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 sort of in your own journey. Well, go ahead, honey. Okay. Uh, my upbringing was in California. So I, in the LA area, so I wasn't in a restrictive kind of environment. Nevertheless, the world was much more homophobic during the time of my growing up uh, than it is now. And the experience of National Coming Out Day have a lot to do with that, of course. My personal uh, coming out began when I was about 19. And it was I was very much in that private phase of the process where I would tell some people and not tell other people. Was very careful about who knew or who didn't know. Um, in June of 1979, I was fortunate to to attend the experience workshop, which was at that time known as the advocate experience. And it really blew the doors wide open on my life. Um, I began to synthesize the part of me that was in the closet with the part of me that was out. I had a greater sense of self love and self care. Uh, I began to be more out in uh, all aspects of my life and to participate in the process of inspiring others to do the same. And I continued that with great vigor uh, as a volunteer with the experience, as a staff member with the experience, as a facilitator. Uh, that brought me all the way up to uh, 88 when National mm -hmm. Coming Out Day, which was, um, which was a kernel of the, of the power of the workshop itself which was about loving yourself, coming out, being more integrated. Um, the National Coming Out Day was the way to take all of that into a, not only a personal, but a national and even an international um, expression of love and empowerment. Fantastic. And Lynn, uh, what would you like to add uh, to sort of piggyback on what Honey has said? Well. Even, even though I was a gay activist for many, many years, it still is very difficult to go back to the 70s and 
and think of how, hmm, how difficult it was to just sort of be yourself. And then the political ramifications of that. Um, so it, 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 was, it was odd. It doesn't relate to how we are now. Of course, here I am sitting in California. That's easy for me to say. But um, it, it was a lot harder to just sort of be yourself and to refer to your partner or your loved one or whatever in a proper manner when uh, when dealing with other people or when dealing with people at at work certainly and there were ramifications for being out there were ramifications for for being out of the for for being out you could you could lose your job you could lose everything you could lose your kids it was you know it was semi nasty so you so when uh, Rob Eichberg and um, Gene O'Leary and Gene O'Leary came up with this idea, gosh, what if what if there was a day where everybody knew? Um, wouldn't what would that do? And it was just a thought, and they they talked about it with their closest friends and allies um, for a long time, and then we get to the March on Washington in October of '87 which was tremendous. And even though it was um, recorded improperly um, by the Associated Press at, at two o'clock in the afternoon as being 200,000 people, by the time everybody got there, you know, they were on gay time, by the time everybody got there, it was 600,000 people. And the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, bless them, uh, are practically the only newspaper that got it right and put it in their headline. Um, so it was an enormous, step for people to take and out of it came a lot of movement forward in the, in the community it was great one of the reasons i wanted us to have this conversation today is to preserve what we recall for history for <laughs> legacy for me legacy has always been important you know and initially mm -hmm. One of the great healing properties of the experience, which we'll get into, is, it, well, it was very healing. And in, in my early activism, I was driven by this overwhelming desire to make a difference of my life, but I also had a complete vacuum of self-esteem, and I had this desperation at my core. And yeah. my work in the experience allowed me, along with other ways that I grew to come to know, love, accept, fully embrace myself so I could actually be much more effective um, as an activist and as a human being. But speaking of legacy, you know, Rob Eichberg and Gene O'Leary are no longer with us. Um, I've put up a link where people can actually find the episode of The Oprah Winfrey Show that was broadcast on October 11th, 1988, um, featuring Rob and Jean and a, a throng of other people. And um, they are no longer with us. Their legacy continues. And in, in so many ways, it seems like every single day that we're living is a memorial to the people that taught us who we are and, and how to be. That at, a, at its core is, I think, life. I don't know why I got so deeply philosophical, but do either one of you want to comment on that? Honey, why don't you comment and tie it into the healing work of the experience? Absolutely. And I also would love to tie it into the, uh, to the different states of consciousness that people can come from to make a difference. Um, at, at the time that the experience began, um, the, the leadership of the gay community wanted to make more of a difference, but they were consistently coming from an understandably aggressive uh, state of consciousness. Because we felt embittered and embattled, it was, uh, it, it fighting back felt like the thing to do and, and the only option. And uh, through the uh, workshop that Rob created, mm -hmm. which was the advocate experience, subsequently the experience, he was able to inspire and empower a group of leaders in the San Francisco Bay Area, including David B. Goodstein, the other founder of the workshop, to 
see that integrating their lives, coming from a more powerful place, there are 10 states of consciousness from which we can come. And if we had enough time, we could go through all of them. But with, suffice to say, the powerless and depressed state of consciousness keeps you always doing battle and easy to feel small. But when you can expand to a more loving and empowered state of consciousness, it is more healing, as you just described. It also allows us the opportunity to inspire and attract allies, to have people hear us in ways that, uh, that can really make a difference. And it also keeps us in a state of loving kindness, which will impact everything that we do in the world. Very well stated. I, I wanted to segue, segue, backtrack. Um, so there was a conference in early 1988 called the War Conference, where a hundred or so leading activists in the, uh, at the time it was referred to quite frankly as the gay and lesbian civil rights movement. I'm so f happy that we've expanded to LGBT QI plus mm -hmm. and more, but uh, 100 or so leading activists got together. And one of the projects that came out of the war conference was the official uh, procession toward the first national coming out day. Jean O'Leary, who, by the way, was a former nun, mm -hmm. Rob Eich and Rob Eichberg were both positioned in places in history and at that time where their collaboration was key to uh, providing uh, uh, the context for the first National Coming Out Day to begin. Uh, as the head of National Gay Rights Advocates, Gene O'Leary was, a, was a, um, at the helm of a powerful uh, or national organization with an infrastructure. And as one of the founders of the experience with his own deep history in psychology and healing and transformation, Rob Eichberg was connected to a grassroots movement of thousands of individuals who had each done enough of their own powerful work to really forge ahead um, in in creating the first ever National Coming Out Day. Do you feel like I've summarized that well, and is there anything either of you would like to add? Uh, I think you did a, a good summary. I, I would add that Lynn was a, a participant in that war conference, and, and I do think there were 200 people and not 100, but she, can, she knows the best on that. <laughs> well, Lynn, add to that. To the, well, to the, best of my, to the best of my memory, it was 110. But oh, okay. you know, it, was, it, it was a wonderful thing. There were um, executive directors and leaders and board presidents and so forth of many different uh, gay organizations from around the country. And we met at, uh, in Manassas, Virginia at, I think was, I don't know, it was a, it was a hotel for lack of a better word, but it had a, a checkered past. Um, and there were all kinds of workshops and you know, the stuff went on for three days. Um, and But we had to, our people were dying at a record pace from HIV. Um, George Bush Sr. had just said, nah, we don't want anything to do with you. Ronald Reagan had said, we don't want anything to, anything to do with uh, people with HIV. So there was this upset. We either had to go to war with our own government, or we had to figure it out. And this was the weekend that we were gonna figure it out. And the great uh, work of the staff in pulling together all the ideas and all the upset and all the solutions that came to, to, came to be. And one of the four things that we decided on was that there should be a national day of coming out. Tori Osborne, who we all know, she suggested that October 11th, because of the march, and because that was um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's birthday, as you said, honey, that that was a great day, and that that's what we would do. And so there we went. There it was. So in October of 88 was the first uh, NCOD, and there were just a few places. I know that 
uh, LA because NGRA was was uh, based in LA and Rob Eichberg was based in LA at the time. There was that going on, and then it it just shot out like a cannon. It was such a great idea. Um, there was some resistance, like we were going to force people to come out. Nonsense. But it was such a great idea because people were ready. They were ready to do something positive. They were ready to do something effective. And what we knew was that if people knew you were gay, they stopped in their prejudice. So that was huge. That was enormous. And that's really a metaphor for, you know, that's part of the power of coming out. It's a, it's simply a metaphor for living powerfully and telling the truth. So it doesn't matter whether sexual orientation or gender identity is the issue of coming out or whether it's the fact that that you're a, a Muslim in a Christian neighborhood or whatever the case may be, or that you know you are a you are a multiracial person, or just whatever the case may be, whatever it is that you hold back. And of course, people in, in recovery, people in 12-step programs at preach this more than anybody, you know, your, your secrets are your worst enemy. Your secrets make mm -hmm. you sick. So coming out is just a metaphor for living powerfully and telling the truth. Lynn said, you know, we, we weren't forcing anybody to come out. Of course, uh, forcing people to come out is never going to be as effective as inspiring people to come out. That's, I mean, if nothing else, it's marketing 101. Everybody knows mm -hmm. that. But what happens is that when people are inspired to take their next step, when people are inspired to live more powerfully, um, they become more of an asset, not only to themselves, but also to their community. And that is true in any area and throughout life, throughout time. So, uh, you know, I have some issue with uh, what HRC says to do whatever feels comfortable I think stretching ourselves is important. And if we only always do what feels comfortable, and I remember Candace Gingrich was speaking at an event in our backyard one time in, in Santa Fe when she was you know, uh, representing HRC, and she talked about doing what's comfortable. And I, and I said then, we have to do more than what's comfortable or we'll never grow. You know, it's, it's not comfortable to go exercise every day if exercising is what you wanna do. But if you don't do it, you won't make progress and you won't be in the space of energy of progress. And that really matters. Well, that's all very well said. Um, being getting outside of your comfort zone, you know, it, many of us were coming out and risking our lives. And, to, and today people that that is so true. You know, I'm a, living in Palm Springs, California, I'm a privileged white guy. You know, my experience is nothing like what people are facing all over the world right now. So uh, your good friend Van English, who believe it or not, I've known virtually all these years, but I've never met in person, oh. says David and I celebrate our 21 years together and credit the experience and National Coming Out Day for making our relationship possible. Um, Hi, I wanted to- David. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say that I, as the result of uh, taking the experience, I ended up as one of the two full-time paid staff people for National Coming Out Day, working in the offices of National Gay Rights Advocates in West Hollywood for a matter of months. And regarding that first year, um, we traveled to Washington, D.C. for National Coming Out Day because there was a, a display of the Names Project Memorial Quilt. So we had a presence in Washington, D.C. But I like to say that the first National Coming Out Day reached uh, over 20 million people. And it's true because of the Oprah Winfrey Show, her daily audience at that time, I, I want to say I remember it was 25 million. I'm not clear about that, but I'm for sure that it was over 20 million people. So the first National Coming Out Day uh, did um, reach millions of people. Um, we have an interesting question and I actually know the, an the uh, answer to it. So let me put the question on screen. Did Keith Haring volunteer to create the iconic NCO image, 
NCOD image, or was he approached by the founders? Um, actually, I don't know the answer to that question. Do you know I if he was Lynn volunteered does. or asked, uh, Lynn? I do, and I'm going to have a brain cramp here because I'm going to forget the guy's name who did ask for us. The founders, of Robin uh, uh, Jean, did not ask, but um, but they're so, but they're wonderful, wonderful activists in the in the New York community who did ask him, and I apologize for not remembering his name right off, but it did it did happen. Well. I'm bringing I'm bringing up a photo taken this week of me holding mm -hmm. my poster, and if you look closely, you can see that there is the printed Keith Haring signature, and there is an actual Keith mm -hmm. Haring signature signed on it. Now you can tell that my poster is faded, and I don't really think that mm -hmm. monetarily it's it's uh, has any great value but it does to me mm -hmm. for sure yeah. and um i actually can i i, I remember quite mm -hmm. clearly that when keith shipped uh the box of posters uh i don't remember how many he shipped mm -hmm. he shipped them uh to the offices of national gay rights advocates mm -hmm. and i remember going into gene o'leary's office with greg Kason, who's the other uh, mm -hmm. uh, full-time staff member. Actually, he did much more work than I did. I, <laughs> I don't really know what I accomplished being there, other than I know that I was part of it. So let me just put that out there. But um, in if I remember correctly, in the office with Gene O'Leary, when we spoke on the speakerphone with Keith Haring, was Greg Kason, myself, and I want to say Bill Eisentraut, who was in fundraising okay. for National Gay Rights Advocates, was in the office. Jim McDaniel was another person that was on staff at the time. But uh, we were on the phone with Keith, and I, I don't think I personally spoke with him, but Gene thanked him. And as a result of being in the loop, I was uh, I, I ended, ended up having... Um, one of those posters. So that's a piece of history that I'm not sure many other people would have recounted, but that's one of my special National Coming Out Day stories. I'm sure you're one of the, just a few people on the planet who would know that. That's great. So um, I, I actually have uh, searched, um, I've searched Twitter for National Coming Out Day hashtag, and I'm going to take the bold step of uh, sharing the live Twitter feed and reading some of it. So um, what I love it are that gay men have uh, reclaimed the Proud Boys hashtag. Isn't that fabulous? And so these are three Proud Boys uh, identifying themselves as family who uh, use hashtag Proud, uh, Proud Boys, hashtag National Coming Out Day. I'm going through the advertisements. Um, congrats to all who've came out and the ones who haven't. You're just as valid and loved. I'm proud of all of you. That's... Uh, V on uh, Twitter. I'm happily queer. Reverend Joe Cast, family, I love us. No right way to come out and no such thing as too old or too young. We're here when you're ready. I hope that your family and our allies provide a soft place for your heart to land. When you do come out, God loves you. That is true. Uh, One Direction Infection, Happy National Coming Out Day. I'm proud of all of you. And there's more, but when we go to the top tweets on National Coming Out Day, Mary L. Trump, who, by the way, is an out lesbian, she mm -hmm. says, to those of you who are not yet ready, that's okay. Know that you are loved, you are accepted, and we are here for you. Someday we will all be able to celebrate National Coming Out Day together in solidarity uh, and with pride. But at the top of this, oh, there's Randy Rainbow showing his baby picture in the incubator. And 
at the top, I believe that we have, I think Joe Biden was the, the top tweet. Um, well, we have so many people tweeting now for National Coming Out Day, but Joe Biden was among, uh, among them. No so, surprise. How spectacular is that? Um, we have, uh, hello, Nani from Bangkok here, Sawadi Krap. Um, I can do that because I lived in Thailand for five and a half years. So National Coming Out Day started in the United States, but it has a global impact still today. How cool is that? Very. It's, it's very cool. In fact, the year that uh, Na National Coming Out Day moved from West Hollywood to, to being based in Santa Fe, one of the things that happened was that we went from 14 states to all 50 states plus seven other countries. And that, you know, that was really great. People really took to it because they wanted to figure out a, you know, people have been clamoring for a way to have a, not just be in a defensive mode, but to come out and be as inspiring as they knew how to be and to express their personal authority. And they started doing it and it, it was wildfire, it was great. Um, describe, Honey or Lynn, how National Coming Out Day ended up being based in Santa Fe and also how it went on to sort of live within uh, the HRC. Well, Lynn has more to share about that, having served as the executive director, but I, I would uh, want to just toss in a, an important piece, one of our uh, friends and colleagues in uh, Santa Fe, Pilo Bueno, was the staff person when National Coming Out Day first moved under uh, Rob's leadership in Santa Fe, uh, as opposed to Jean's in West Hollywood. They were both still involved, but they also both had their own big lives and big projects, so they shared the masterminding and when it moved to Santa Fe, Pilo Bueno was the first person on staff before uh, Lynn came in and uh, and became the executive director. And so I want to just make sure we get a hat tip in for Pilo before Lynn takes it away about uh, your question. Okay, Lynn, take it away. No, Pilo is awesome. He did a great job. And, uh, you know, it's hard to run a, a nationally, a nationwide movement uh, from in the middle of the country. It's unexpected. The phone calls and letters we would get every day from people in the middle of the country saying, oh my God, you're the first national organization in the middle of the country. Well, we're, they were dying for some recognition that wasn't from one coast or the other. And that was really heartwarming. Um, and eye-opening. So we, you know, our board of directors was located in different parts of the country and they all did local um, activities. And then gradually it became aware, it, we became aware that, look, if we're going to really reach as many people as we want to reach, we have to have more resources and nobody better than the human rights campaign to, with a lot of resources, to be able to take National Coming Out Day as a project and proceed with it. So that's where the trans, so we went from 1990 to 93 operating out of Santa Fe. And then in 93, um, we handed it over to HRC and they've done a great job. And continue and, to do a great yeah, job. Yeah, yes, honey? I would just add for that part in the early years, um, graduates of the experience throughout the country were the key base of volunteers, funders, board members, yes. everything it takes to do a, a national organization or a local organization, but this was on a national scale, um, that among other good-hearted, skilled people who had vision, that, that people who were engaged in the experience were primed for leadership in all of this. 
and, and did a remarkable job. Anywhere you looked, there were people who were graduates of the experience workshop in any city in America, and they were right in the middle of coming out day. And, and other good projects. And, and of course, we were all, um, you know, fighting for our lives and working hard at whatever the, at whatever the cause was uh, within the LGBT community, but experienced graduates were right at, at the center of every, almost everything. Exactly. Everything, I, everything I found anywhere, there they were. Well, that's true, and it's such an important point. And uh, I don't know if all of this history will be preserved, but all of the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted for my entire media archives, including this episode, to land permanently at the one archives at the USC libraries. So that's a wonderful that, place. That is certainly um, a done deal, and uh, mm -hmm. and we're having a conversation that's helping to uh, preserve our history. Uh, is there anything either one of you would like to say about any related topics, the experience, National Coming Out Day, uh, from a historical perspective that we haven't touched upon? Wow. That's a, uh, uh, I, it's a big question. Um, I, I guess I, I guess I would say one thing is that we, we, um, I'll speak for myself. I sometimes don't even think about the gay stuff. I don't even think about it anymore, but you know what? There are people on the Supreme court who want to take away my rights. They have spoken. So in the last couple of weeks, there are people about to be on the Supreme Court who would just as soon take away our right to marry. So this is not a, oh, isn't that quaint? That's what happened then and now things are fine. No, not exactly. We can lose it all if we're not mindful, if we don't take action, if we don't vote, uh, if we don't support the people who support us, we can lose it all. And I don't like to think it, but it's, it's really the case. And so what it means is every generation, just like democracy, we could lose it all. Every generation has to do what it takes to keep our democracy, our freedom um, alive. And we have to do it. Uh, totally. Honey, you wanted to add something? I, I would like to add something. Uh, and I totally agree with the, the challenges that Lynn is describing and and am right in the heart of, of what I can do to to keep us moving forward and to hold on to the to the uh, to the rights that we have and to continue to expand those and continue to expand the base of people around the country and around the world that are focused from a higher perspective because the people who are clamoring for things to be smaller who are angry who are who want to limit freedoms they're the same in every generation they come from a fearful place they come from a smaller place we all have that within us our challenge and our opportunity is to keep coming from the space that is more expanded more open more loving and by no means does that mean sitting on a mountaintop uh, meditating, although I spent 30 minutes meditating this morning. I'm a, I'm a big proponent and, and practicer. But it does mean taking that inner peace and operating from a higher perspective, our more conscious perspective, from a space of love in all of the actions that we take on so we don't create more hostility and uh, and aggression, but more an openness and a space that can inspire and draw people in. Completely. Uh, I have another comment, honey. It makes, a, but before I put it on the screen, I want to get your permission. It references, sure. it references a letter. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Does, does um, it reference? Okay, go ahead. So, 
Uh, Michael says, hey friends, good to see you. On NCOD in 1988 in Indiana, I sent the now infamous letter to my friends and family coming out as transgender and that I was transitioning to Michael. I remember it well. Um, speaking of which, I meant to grab it. It's on my shelf. But uh, Rob Eichberg went on to write a book called Nish, uh, Coming Out, an Act of Love. Yeah. And chapter one concludes with my letter to my mom. And uh, um, one of the things that I'll just say, and this, uh, this goes to what you were just talking about, honey, is that I had come out to my mom and my stepfather before I ever did the experience a few years before. And my sort of consciousness at the time was I was going to, I was telling them something that was terrible, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, five years later or whatever it was, I was able to express in a completely different way. So, uh, definitely it made an impact in my life and as you as you know in, in 1993 i created tinseltown's queer on public access tv and i've just never stopped taking my next step i could not run a marathon in real life but i have been running a marathon as an activist i was thinking this morning how inspiring your career is because you just keep creating something new and running with it and you you just do it decade after decade may i May I just touch on that issue about the letter a moment? Yes. Okay. Uh, just for people who are unfamiliar, in the process of these workshops and in directly touching on what you just said, we, we have people craft letters, coming out letters, designed to tell the people closest to them the truth about their lives. For many people in our workshops, it's been about sexual orientation or gender identity. But it can really be about anything. What is it that we with, have been withholding from the people closest to us? And then we encourage people to share those letters uh, to both have a more powerful life as an individual, but also to enhance the lives of the people with whom we are in relationship, because now we're not holding back. Completely. Just wanted to give a little context. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, and, uh, my journey includes now 19 years of sobriety. So it just never stops until it does, because then we're not here. But yeah. because of our work and our commitment, we'll, we'll never really not be here. Yes. Uh, this has been a very exciting episode. Um, I think that uh, it would be fun to return to Twitter uh, for a little bit. So, um, Oops, I've shared this, the whole screen and not a particular window, so just want, bear with me. Uh, application Twitter. Okay, good. So um, we see that Ellen has shared Happy National Coming Out Day. Here's to celebrating coming out while we're all staying in. And moving over to uh, the latest tweets. I never really know what I'm seeing because we're going to Twitter Live. Uh, Dana White says, respectable queer society wants days like this to all be all about heartwarming linear stories of courage with happy endings. The more Hallmark channel, the better. They want the it gets better message. It's harder before better for many of us. Honey, that gets back to your point about not necessarily taking the easier, softer way, but doing, yeah. taking the tough, scary steps. Exactly. And, and I would say that part, one place we can get caught is if we think we are going to do this thing, we're going to come out, and then everybody's, everything's going to be great. Everybody's going to be happy. The homophobic dad is all of a sudden going to have an epiphany and be wonderful. That may or may not happen. In a lot of cases, it does, and it's really fabulous. A lot of cases, people don't have trouble on the job. A lot of cases, people feel more acceptance from their grandmother, whatever it might be. But we can't do it for that because we have no control how, over how other people choose to respond. 
We must always act from a place of our own integrity and intention, from our own consciousness. Otherwise, it's a, it's a prescription for disaster. Because if somebody doesn't respond the way we would wish they would, then we give away our power to their rejection. Atma says, a friend of all of ours, who I know because of you and National Coming Out Day right. and the experience, thanks to the experience, each day <clears throat> is coming out day. Um, well, I said this so uh, before we went on the air, but I love you both, and I'm glad that we're all still here. Um, Thank walking you. I the love walk. you. And... Um, I'm going to give you each a final statement. And then when I end the show, if you'll stick around, we can have a short conversation afterwards. So uh, why don't we start with you, Lynn, for a, a final remark? The only thing I would say is that um, Honey's right. You have to do this. You can stop or... there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um you have to do this for yourself because it will bring you peace. What happens after the information is out there is what happens. But bringing yourself peace brings yourself, it brings me authority that I have. You don't get to define me, I get to do it. And so that brings me strength and so it's the internal into the activism. Okay. And aside from you being right, honey, what would you like to be right about? <laughs> I, I, I don't need to be right. I just like to make jokes. <laughs> that was No, that was very funny. <laughs> so I, I would, first of all, like to thank you, Nicholas, for your decades of activism mm -hmm. and, um, and creating a world that works for, for everybody, doing your part of that. Uh, is really makes a big difference, and and I would like to uh, I would like to oh and of course I'd like to say it's been great being here with you too, Lynn. So this is wonderful. We got to see each other <laughs> ten days ago, so that's that's a, been a big treat. Uh, but in terms of the broader uh, world, I I just want to these are these are fraught times right now. It's it's there are tough times, and we all get caught. Um, I know I do, and I pretty much believe everybody else does too, especially in this country. And I just want to encourage everybody to keep breathing, keep doing the things that work, keep doing your personal practice that helps you have a, a more powerful experience of your life. Keep coming out, telling the truth, remember to vote, all of those things so that, so that your experience of life can be as rich and full and meaningful as possible and that you're making the difference that you're here to make in this world. Thanks. I could have cried so many times during this show. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this is very well. So, uh, I'm just so um, happy that we had this conversation today on the 32nd National Coming Out Day and, um, and there's more. Yes.